very much. Yeah, uh, thank you, and uh, welcome. I really appreciate you coming today. I understand that there are conflicting demands on your time, and so the fact you chose to come and talk a little bit about intermediary liability is uh, exciting to me. It is a topic of some passion for me, so um, I'm, uh, I'm excited to explore it with you. Um, and I just want to start by setting a context. For those of you who didn't have a chance to look at some of the work that I've done, I'm at one end of the extreme if you were to uh, sort all the different policy norms um, about uh, internet intermediary liability. So just to contextualize it, I love Section 230. We'll talk about what that means in a moment. But it gets the big red heart uh, because I feel really strongly and excited about it. And many of you, if you're uh, familiar with it, may have some doubts about it. And those of you who aren't familiar may be shocked at what it says. Um, and so I am like a major fan of Section 230. And you're not likely to have encountered that very often because I am at one of inspection. Um, so uh, if the whole cyber libertarianism thing comes on really strong, you're not saying, you know, whoa, that's kind of unexpected. That should be expected here. Um, let me uh, talk a little bit about Section 230. Uh, so this is a U.S. law that was enacted in 1996. It was part of the Communications Decency Act, which was uh, the federal government's first effort to crack down on the Internet. Um, back in 1996. How much do we know about the Internet and what it would look like in 2016? We knew nothing. Um, and the efforts to crack down were incredibly poorly designed, even based on what we knew at the time. But, section, uh, but 1996 was an unusual time because there was a weird ethos um, among many people that we knew we were seeing something transformative in our lives, that the Internet was going to change our lives in a way that only a limited number of technologies have ever changed human history. You think about the wheel, or you think about fire, um, you think about uh, the invention of the automobile or the railroad. There are certain transformative innovations, and the Internet is going to, we knew in the time that the Internet felt like it might be one of those. Um, so in the mid-1990s, there was this strand of thinking that the Internet was something really special, and we don't want to muck it up with regulatory intervention. Um, now, uh, that, any feelings about that are completely gone. And there is every regular in the world would be delighted to muck up the Internet in the interest of trying to improve the Internet. But at the time, the fear was that regulars thought we can only do damage here if we overregulate. Let's not do that. So they enacted a law in 1996, and this is the text of it. Um, no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as a publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. Now, some of you are saying, I don't have any clue what that could possibly mean. This is not an American English language translation problem. This is just bad drafting. Okay, let's acknowledge that as a problem. This is not how ordinary polite people talk to each other. Um, <laughs> nevertheless, let me tell you what it means in American English. It means, quite simply, that websites, mobile apps, anyone that's an intermediary in the online context isn't liable for third-party contents or actions. Okay, now you're going to start already, uh, knowing the quality education, you're going to start to pick this apart. That can't mean what it says here. This is like a shorthand for stuff. Let's talk about all the exceptions. And there are a few, but there are not many. It actually means that websites and mobile apps aren't liable for third-party content or actions. Once you embrace that proposition, a lot of things become much easier. As long as you fight the proposition, you're looking for the exceptions, and that's going to lead you astray. That's not where the case law takes you. Um, I want to give you a little summary chart here that will try and help you understand how Section 230 compares to another U.S. law, the uh, 17 U.S.C. 512C. This is the DMCA notice and takedown provisions. Um, and uh, the DMCA notice and takedown provisions were, I think, a partial inspiration for things like the e-commerce directive. So you might be somewhat familiar with the stuff on the right because it should look somewhat similar to what you learned about in the e-commerce directive. Section 230 looks quite different, and let me make that case to you. Um, who's covered under Section 230 or the copyright notice and takedown? Basically anyone on the Internet. That's about the same. Uh, what's covered? Well, obviously the copyright uh, safe harbor only covers copyright. Um, Section 230, however, covers any claim that's based on third-party content or actions, except three statutorily enumerated exceptions. 
First, it excludes intellectual property. That's why we needed a separate provision in U.S. law to uh, apply to copyright, because Section 230 doesn't apply. It also wouldn't apply to things like federal trademark claims, and there might be a few other things that are within that bucket. Section 230 does not apply to federal criminal prosecutions. So if the federal government wants to bring a criminal action against an Internet intermediary, Section 230 does nothing to help them out. However, the elements of the crime might not easily apply to an intermediary, so we don't see many federal criminal prosecutions against intermediaries. They're actually quite rare. They're usually quite high stakes. There's usually millions, um, uh, if not tens or hundreds of millions of dollars involved. Um, and then we're going to ignore this third one. This is basically a null set. This is about uh, wiretapping uh, exclusions. Okay, so Section 230 is this really broad coverage. It says that it's going to apply to any claim unless it fits into one of these three statutorily enumerated provisions. The notice and takedown in the U.S. is only limited to copyright. We have a de facto notice and takedown uh, scheme for trademarks, but it's not codified anywhere. Um, and, of course, in Europe, you would expect that it would look a lot like the notice and takedown for most situations, given the e-commerce directive. So now here's where things start to get interesting. Um, what is the intermediary's duty upon getting a notice of a problem? The notice might say, you have defamatory content on your website. You must remove it or take liability. That would be a kind of common notice we expect on the left-hand side. Um, and what does Section 230 say? Section 230 says if, if the intermediary gets that notice, they can ignore it. They can flush it down the toilet if they want to. And that will not change their liability exposure. <clears throat> Um, in uh, the U.S., the uh, 17 U.S.C. 512C, it says expeditious takedown. Once you get a notice of copyright infringement, you are expected to expeditiously remove it or take all liability associated with it. What about the level of scienter on the part of the intermediary? What do they know about the content? Um, it could be because they got notice or it could be because they're doing other forms of managing or shaping their database. Um, Section 230 says there's no consequence. They can know as much or as little as they want about the user content database, and it will not affect their eligibility for this Section 230 immunity. If you have Sienter about copyright infringement on your site, there's a number of ways in which 17 U.S.C. 512C becomes unavailable. You lose your safe harbor if you have the wrong Sienter. Um, what about requirements to de-anonymize uh, users, to know who your users are? Section 230, there's no obligation uh, to uh, know who your users are or to disclose any information about them. Um, in, under uh, 512C, there's a mandatory subpoena provision. If a copyright owner thinks that the intermediary knows the identity of the user, they can go to the court, and they're, uh, uh, the court is obligated to issue them a subpoena requiring the disclosure of who uh, was behind a particular account. Um, this, of course, differs from things like the Defamation Act uh, here in the UK, where, as you know, you, in order to get the notice and takedown scheme, you also must make sure that you can identify who the user is enough to allow them to be uh, subject to a lawsuit. So notice Section 230 is really quite different than the Defamation Act. Uh, here, web hosts neither need to respond to a notice, nor do they have to know who their users are. They're still protected. Um, last thing I'll mention is what prerequisites are required. In order to get Section 230, no prerequisites. Just by virtue of being an interactive computer service that uh, uh, publishes or speaks uh, third-party content, you automatically qualify. Um, in 512C, you are required to make a registration with the government, and then there's about a dozen other formalities. And if you blow any one of those formalities, you lose the safe harbor. So it's quite easy to lose the copyright safe harbor before you even get the takedown notice because you didn't satisfy the formalities. You can't lose the Section 230 immunity because there are no formalities with which you have to apply. Okay, Section 230 is a pretty amazing piece of statutory drafting. Putting aside that it's not in English, it says websites and mobile apps are not liable for third-party content. The only exceptions are intellectual property, federal criminal prosecutions, or this null set, ECPA. Um, it's as simple as that. We have seen dozens, if not hundreds, of cases where plaintiffs, being as creative as they possibly can, have said, let me try and get around what Congress said in 1996. Almost without exception, those cases have failed. When they have succeeded, they've been overturned on appeal it is almost impossible to hold an intermediary liable for user-generated content unless it's in one of these three statutory exclusions. Okay, 
that's a little bit of an introduction to uh, Section 230. Let me now take it to uh, the, the thread of my argument. I'm going to make four assertions in this argument. Um, the first is that consumer reviews are an example of internet exceptionalism. They prove what we thought in 1996 that the internet was somehow different from other media. Um, I'll make my case about why consumer reviews prove that. Then I'm going to make the argument that consumer reviews improve marketplace efficiency so that we're going to see stronger markets because of the presence of consumer reviews. Next argument is that we see consumer reviews because of Section 230. That it's Section 230 that enables these consumer reviews that create this marketplace efficiency. And then my final argument is that Section 230 creates a trans-border competitive advantage. That because there are globally different um, uh, regulatory schemes, um, that we're going to see different outcomes for society accordingly. Okay, let me get uh, drill, drill into this first. So uh, my title of my talk was... Um, uh, consumer reviews and uh, um, uh, uh, and economic policy. So I need to have a bar chart, right? If I'm going to talk about economics, we need to have a bar chart. So here's my brilliant bar chart. How many consumers do we have offline? None. How many do we have online? Lots. Okay. Did you follow the economics that lives anywhere in there? I know sometimes people get a little intimidated by economics, but it's actually quite simple. And judges, judges can understand that. Yeah, well, look, it's, it's not negotiable. The chart shows that there's an infinite percentage greater number of uh, online consumer reviews than offline. Um, now, this is a little bit of a, a cheat, obviously, but that's what we do as economists. Um, and uh, the cheat is um, how we define what a consumer review is. Uh, in the offline world, if we wanted to share our perspectives about goods and services in the marketplace, we would obviously talk to our friends. We would have this word of mouth. The, you know, most common spaces were in the office setting, at the water cooler, or in the John, uh, Lou, uh, what do you call it? Um, and, uh, huh, what? The powder room. The powder room, right. <laughs> you know, you're talking and you're saying, you know, hey, Joe, how's your weekend? I saw this great movie, or I saw a movie that really wasn't fun, or whatever the case may be. That kind of uh, serendipitous exchanges are part of our ordinary society. But if you wanted to reach beyond your circle of friends that you were talking to personally, you really didn't have a lot of great choices in the offline world. There wasn't a good way to get on a soapbox and to share your perspectives about goods and services in the marketplace to any larger audience than that. Obviously, today, there are many ways to do that online. We're doing that as a regular um, uh, a part of our online activities. Um, and so... Um, th this is a little bit cheap, but if you see where I'm going, the idea of reaching some group of consumers outside your circle of friends, you really have very few offline techniques to do so. And online, of course, we've seen hundreds of millions of consumer reviews that have been generated over the years um, that uh, really couldn't have existed in any way in the offline world. There are other types of reviews. Reviews that were in the offline world. So, for example, we had professional reviews. You would read what the food critic or the movie critic would say in the newspaper or in a magazine. Um, and so there were those professional gatekeepers that were steering people to or from goods or services in the marketplace, but from a relatively limited vantage point. They were one expert with their own idiosyncrasies, and they were paid to do their job. It wasn't the same kind of organic... Uh, a genuine type of interchange that we have when we're consumers talking to each other. Okay, so to me, this is a really important point because one of the questions that we've long had is whether the internet really is different from other media, such that we might choose to regulate it differently than other media. And the consumer reviews, the fact that we have some new class of content that really didn't exist in the offline world, that class of content exists solely because of the internet, it means we might need to regulate it differently than the offline world. This might be a class of content worth fighting for, worth preserving, now that we know exists, that we didn't, wouldn't have had if we had a different regulatory policy and a different technology. Okay, so to me, consumer reviews are a flagship example of how the internet truly is different. We're getting a class of content that we didn't see in the offline world. Now, if you think about marketplace efficiency, um, the way it works, the, the, the stereotypical economic uh, assumptions are if consumers and uh, vendors have perfect information about each other, then 
there will be the possibility of making perfectly competitive markets where buyers and sellers will be able to negotiate with each other on a friction-free basis. They'll be able to set the prices based on their, each of their own reservation prices for what it would take to transact. And through those uh, barters, through those exchanges, that the marketplace will achieve efficiency in allocating goods and services to those who value it the most. And that's the basic theory behind the invisible hand from Adam Smith, who says there's this invisible hand sweeping through our economy, allocating these goods and services. And the key input to the invisible hand is having enough information that buyers and sellers can each make enough, uh, a, a good enough assessment about what the goods or services are worth in order to be able to set their reservation prices accordingly. So consumer reviews are helping the invisible hand sweep through our economy because they're giving us a bunch of information to help make those valuation settings. As a consumer, you're finding out these are the producers that are worth transacting with or these are the producers that are worth avoiding. So that information is helping decide who to transact with and how much you're willing to pay for it. It's helping the invisible hand do the things that eco economists have always theorized. I would argue that also um, this information is especially valuable because it's uh, hard information to otherwise obtain. Uh, without a consumer review, all this great knowledge about who are the good vendors uh, and who are the bad vendors is locked in each individual consumer's heads. And what consumer reviews do, they pull that information, uh, this, this high value subjective information, out of consumers' heads and then they and create what we call the wisdom of the crowds. They allow us to get the consensus about the marketplace. Which are the good producers? Which are the bad producers? What's the appropriate valuation to set? And as you may know, the wisdom of the crowd says that the consensus view of even lay people is more accurate than the opinionated version of an expert. So an, a, an expert can come and tell you, this is how much a good is worth, and this is the right person to transact with. And they might be right. But they're more likely to be right if we can get a larger data set to draw from and if we can find the consensus from that. That's why when you look at those star ratings, which are a little bit skewed, um, but you can see, if you see someone who has a lot of ratings and a five-star uh, uh, average, you're going to think this is probably a crowd pleaser. If you see a lot of ratings and not a lot of stars there, you're going to think this is probably someone who's not keeping their customers happy. That's the wisdom of the crowd speaking to you. It's telling you the aggregate effect of all the unlocking of the subjective information in consumers' heads, putting it into a form that's usable by consumers, um, gives you better results than it would through other techniques uh, that might guide your decision making. We also know that consumer reviews are quite powerful. Let me just give you a few data points. Um, this is uh, based on local businesses, and there are obviously many other types of goods and services. 92% uh, of consumers in the U.S. read online reviews uh, when deciding to whether to transact with local businesses. Um, only 13% will consider business with a one- or two-star rating, and I want to know who these 13% are. I've got stuff to sell them. Um, and 80% uh, of consumers trust online reviews as much as personal recommendations. So the consumer reviews are displacing our word of mouth. Now, think about that. When someone comes to you and says, I just saw this movie and it was great, these are your friends. You want to believe that that's trustworthy. But chances are that the consensus view is going to be more trustworthy than what your friends have to tell you. And that's not because they don't love you. It's just <laughs> like any other expert, one data point is not nearly as good as the, the, the average of a larger data set. Okay, so my argument to you, the second piece, is that consumer reviews are making markets more efficient. They're improving the operation of the visible hand with this high-value information, this wisdom of the crowds that's guiding people to better choices. Uh, there's a source if you want it. Um, okay, now let's talk about Section 230's role in creating and enabling consumer reviews. Um, Section 230 is especially good at protecting um, what we'll call negative, truthful information. So this is the, uh, the, you know, the albino rhino or the, um, uh, you know, the, the rare fish uh, the, from the bottom of the ocean. These are the things that are most highly imperiled. This is the information that's most likely to be driven off the Internet. Now, when you talk about things like uh, 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 positive, truthful information, that kind of information sticks around because who's going to object to it? Um, and uh, uh, when you talk about negative, false information, we hope that information gets driven off the internet. 
But negative truthful information, this is the rare animal that we need to fight to keep from being endangered. And Section 230 does that. It says we're going to create a, a safe zone that helps keep negative truthful information online. So think about an example. Um, publishers, some third-party intermediary who's gathering and disseminating consumer reviews, cannot verify any factual assertion in a review. I'll give you an example. If a review says of a hotel, I could hear my neighbor snoring through the walls and it kept me up at night. Sounds like a true uh, fact, couldn't it? It's got some detail to it. it sounds eternally credible. How is the publisher of a review site, whether it's TripAdvisor, Yelp, or some other hotel uh, review aggregator, going to know if that's true or not? The hotel might object to it. They say, that's not true. Our walls are thick enough that that's not possible. Or that con uh, consumer was highly idiosyncratic. They were hearing things that didn't exist. Um, now, what's a publisher supposed to do when we have that kind of he said, she said, back and forth? The consumer says, I could hear my neighbor snoring. The, uh, um, uh, the hotel says, not possible. What's the publisher going to do? They can't verify that information. What happens in a notice and takedown scheme? If it's not verifiable, it gets scrubbed off the internet. It's coming down. Section 230, what happens when the notice comes in that the, the assertion is not truthful? It's the review website's decision whether or not to remove it or not. They have the choice to say, I can't verify it, but I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt to my, uh, uh, to my author. That information stays up in a Section 230 immunity environment when it gets scrubbed off the Internet in any other legal regime. So what happens in practice is uh, with a notice and takedown scheme, we get what we might call a lopsided database. Positive reviews stay up, negative reviews get suppressed. How valuable to a consumer is a lopsided database filled with positive reviews that may or may not be truthful and negative reviews, the truthful ones which might have been scrubbed? Not very useful. It becomes useless. The entire database loses credibility when you get that kind of skew. So Section 230 maintains the integrity of the user-generated content database because it keeps the stuff that's most likely to be excised and that creates balance in the database rather than a skew or this lopsidedness. Section 230 also promotes competition among review websites. So the idea is that um, there's not a perfect uh, ideal of a, how a review website should be structured. Maybe someday we'll find that perfect ideal, but for right now, we're still trying to figure it out. What's the best methodology for gathering, uh, uh, organizing, and disseminating consumer reviews? Um, and Section 230 says, if you want to have a light touch on your user-generated content database, if you don't want to scrub a lot of reviews, fine. It also says, if you want to take a heavy hand and go and take out as many reviews as you want for whatever reason you want, fine your legal liability is going to be identical regardless of which of those methodologies that you adopted. So you now have the ability as a review website to decide what is my policy about managing this corpus of reviews and it could be different between review websites. They could have different policies. So the result is that we get differentiation in the marketplace. Not everyone adopts the same policy. Think about the offline world. How do newspapers handle content that's submitted to them from third parties? They treat it equivalent to content that uh, uh, they have sourced from uh, an employee. In all cases, they're equally liable for that content. They all go through an editorial vetting process. Now, there might be light differences between the heavy-handedness of that editorial process, but they all do the same thing. Section 230 says you can have heavy-handed uh, management, you can have light-handed management, and everything in between, that means you can get differentiation. We as consumers then can go and decide which of those different review websites are more likely to yield us credible results. It also means that you can experiment. How much experimentation do we see in newspaper content sourcing? None. We haven't seen experimentation in newspaper content sourcing in hundreds of years. The reason why is that the liability scheme has locked in a particular dominant strategy of how you can source content and still manage your legal risk. Nobody's innovating in that space. 
in the online world, we're seeing tons of experimentation. Lots of different levers that review websites are still pulling to try and figure out which ones might work better. Um, so, uh, so Section 230 has created this competition that's allowed for this differentiation and experimentation that we wouldn't see with a different type of liability regime. And the way I'd like to describe it now is that we have a, a regulatory mechanism still that controls how websites manage their corpus of reviews. They still care about delivering credible results. So what happens is that there's a marketplace for review websites, and the review websites are creating information that shapes the overall marketplace for goods and services. So remember, the consumer reviews are affecting <coughs> the, uh, the invisible hand sweeping through and allocating goods and services, and the review website's reputation is shaping the database of review content that is guiding that uh, invisible hand. So I call it the invisible hand of the invisible hand. See the little hand here pushing the bigger hand here? Um, what we have here is that the reputation and concerns about credibility that review websites face forces them to shape their database. And as they're shaping their database, they're guiding the larger invisible hand sweeping through the marketplace. And so this invisible hand needs to be calibrated properly. What would happen if the liability scheme is mismanaged is that the little invisible hand, the re reputation of review websites, would push the big invisible hand in the wrong direction. It might push it this way. It might push it that way, rather than pushing it right where we want it, down the middle. So Section 230 enables, enables this invisible hand and the invisible hand to work properly. If this gets skewed because of regulatory liability, as a result, it pushes the big invisible hand in a potentially wrong direction. Okay, the last of the major arguments I'm going to advance to you is that Section 230 uh, has implications for trans-border competition. Now I'm stepping up from the internet environment and I'm going to talk about the global economy or something important. I'm not sure. Um, and Section 230 is a globally unique policy. Nobody has come anywhere close to adopting a similar rule set. And all we're seeing nowadays is people working further and further from the U.S. policy about um, intermediary liability. The closest that we saw was Brazil's uh, Marco Seville. They had some stuff that was trying to create some rules that would limit liability, and then they totally botched it. And the implementation has actually looked uh, potentially even worse than when they started. So nobody has come close to Section 230. Uh, um, uh, the U.S. stands alone. And if Section 230 is shaping consumer reviews, and consumer reviews are shaping the marketplace for goods and services, Section 230 is improving the efficiency of the U.S. market. It's helping that invisible hand sweep through the U.S. market better. And if the U.S. is getting improved marketplace efficiency compared to its global competitors, then it's going to have relatively better GDP performance. It's going to have its uh, um, <clears throat> economy work better than other global competitors because the market's more efficient, because consumer reviews are making the market more efficient, because Section 230 is guiding uh, the uh, consumer review uh, generation and database. Um, and so uh, what we lead to is the possibility that the U.S. gets richer other people get poor on a relative basis because of this, uh, uh, this uh, legal uh, rule. So when we talk about Section 230, there's often a tendency, in, especially in the U.S., to talk about Section 230 as an enabler of free speech. This is like an example of a statute, of a, of a legislation that advances the constitutional norms of free speech. And let me, don't get me wrong, you've already figured this out, I am a free speech fan. However... I'm not a fan of Section 230 because of what it, it does for free speech in the abstract. I like free speech. That's great. But I'm a fan of Section 230 in part because of what it does for us as a society. It makes us wealthier. It improves our overall social welfare by making the marketplace better. So this is not just about free speech in the abstract, about letting every person have their social right to expression. This is about me having more pocket in my, uh, money in my pocket than other people in other countries. Um, I like Section 230. Did we start with that slide? <laughs> Remember the big red heart? Mm -hmm. um, 
it could be better. Uh, and I'm just going to uh, wrap up here with a few thoughts about how it might be better. Um, so the first thing is uh, that we're seeing across the globe more efforts of regulators to impose authentication or verification requirements to know who is saying uh, um, the co uh, who is providing the content. Um, and I'm not a fan of those laws. We could talk about that if you'd like. Um, but what we're seeing is, irrespective of that, even in the United States, we're seeing more efforts <coughs> on the part of review websites to authenticate their users or to verify that they were an actual consumer of the good or service that they are um, uh, reviewing. So uh, I don't know if they do it here in the UK. In uh, the US, um, Amazon reviews will put a little badge when uh, a buyer reviews a good or service that they purchased through Amazon, they'll call them a verified purchaser. And that will help distinguish from the idea that it could be a review that was written by a competitor that's totally fake, trying to, uh, trying to, to grind an ax. We know that a verified purchaser actually had the opportunity to, to be exposed to the goods. Whereas someone could just write a review in other review websites that is got no basis, in fact, because they never actually consumed the good or service. Um, and we're seeing more trends like that, more efforts to figure out, is the person actually who they say they are, and is the person actually a consumer of the good or service that they're reviewing? That's happening without any legal compulsion. That's, uh, Section 2 there says it's not required, but we're seeing websites experiment with that and try and figure out the best way to do that. I think that's a great thing. I think that this will help <coughs> consumers to get more information about who the reviewer is to make them more credible. However, I will also support a website that doesn't do any of that. If they don't want to do that and they still want to compete in the review website marketplace, I say let them have at it. However, um, we're seeing this as a voluntary thing. I think that's a good thing. There are a few things I would change as a policy matter. Um, Section 230, if you recall, does not apply to intellectual property claims. Remember, that's why we have 512C, that's the copyright notice and takedown provision, because Section 230 didn't apply to it ordinarily. Um, what we're seeing is plaintiffs saying, how can I get around this immunity that says I can't sue the review website and I really, really want to? How do I get around that? Let me find a copyright or trademark claim and bring it against the review website. Mm -hmm. Now, as a, as a matter of legal doctrine, almost always that's a hack. They're trying to stretch copyright or trademark to go too far to do things it wasn't meant to do. We are seeing that in the field a lot, and it is a bastardization of the law. Um, so there are things we could do, and I'm happy to explore <laughs> what? Uh, that will be Andres' question. Uh, <laughs> well, we'll have that in just a moment. <laughs> um, so uh, we need to plug the IB hole to keep um, uh, people from exploiting that one exception to the statutory immunity and looking for ways to take advantage of it, even if it's not a legitimate IP claim. Um, and the United States uh, Congress is considering a thing called the Consumer Review Freedom Act. This law would prevent businesses from putting in contractual terms saying you cannot write a review of my business. Has anyone ever encountered uh, a contract like that? Um, they are uh, coming up with increased frequency. Um, it's part of the vendors trying to manage their relationships with their customers. They're so petrified of getting negative reviews that they say, look, let's just, let's just between you and me as consumer and vendor, let's just agree we aren't going to do the online review thing. Well, okay, that's a real problem, isn't it? Remember, what were we doing with Section 2 there? We were unlocking all this great subjective information in consumers' heads and sharing it to the world at large to create the wisdom of the crowds. Those contracts distort that entire effect. They keep information from going into the wisdom of the crowds. Um, so Congress is considering a law that would say businesses can't contractually ban consumer reviews of their business. I think that's a great thing. I'm a big fan of that. Another thing we could do is uh, implement a federal anti-SLAP laws. Now, SLAPs are an acronym for Strategic Lawsuits Against Public Participation, basically lawsuits designed to squelch socially beneficial speech. Mm -hmm. It is not uncommon that consumer reviews are that kind of socially beneficial speech. Remember, they're exactly what we want for this major social benefit of having more efficient marketplaces and the invisible hand working properly. So when we see lawsuits designed to suppress consumer reviews, we're often distorting the marketplace of ideas in ways that we might not want. And we might want a law that says, if you bring one of those lawsuits against a consumer review, you should suffer the consequences. A typical anti-slap law would A, 
require a fast lane to end the case early. So you say, this looks like a slap, move it to the fast lane, let's kick it out of court early. And second is that it would require a fee shift. The plaintiff would have to write a check to the feds. Now here in the UK, that's quite common. In the United States, that requires a statutory authorization. So this would create that statutory authorization to move the fees. Um, about 30 states have some form of anti-slap law, but they're inconsistent. Not all of them apply to consumer reviews. Um, Congress is considering a federal anti-slap law that would create a national standard for anti-slap laws that would protect consumer reviews. Guess what? I'm a fan of that, too. Um, <laughs> Another thing that we might do is that we might have something like a threats action. Threats action, yes, um, is an action for the wrongful sending of a cease and desist letter or demand letter. I believe you have that here in the UK um, for certain types of claims. Um, we have nothing like that at all in the US. Um, there are a few ways in which uh, the uh, wrongful sending of a, a threatening letter might create a legal obligation, but that's pretty rare. But we could create it, and the reason why we'd want to is anti-slap laws are really good at uh, protecting once a case gets to court. But how many cases get to court? Less than 5% of all disputes? Less than 1% of all disputes? Most of the time, consumer reviews are driven off the internet by the mere threat. Here's how it goes. Businesses sends a letter saying, I'm going to take whatever assets you own. I'm going to take your house. I'm going to take your mobile home if you don't have a house. I'm going to take your sleeping bag if you're homeless. I'm going to take your vet, your your place of residence unless you take down the review. Well, what do you think happens when people get that letter? Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. I cannot let that happen. It's not worth it to me. Mm -hmm. That one review that I posted is just not that important to me. But it's really important to the marketplace of ideas. It's important to that invisible hand and the wisdom of the crowds. So we really want people to stand up when they get those letters. Um, and so a threats action might help with that. Mm -hmm. And if we haven't had enough provocative things to discuss, let me throw out the last most provocative thought, um, which is, what have we learned from this experiment? We have a differential treatment between offline content and online content. And in the online world, we've gotten this really magical thing called consumer reviews. And those consumer reviews have done really great things for our economy and for our society. Well, why would we restrict the offline publishers from getting, creating those same benefits as well? Maybe one of the lessons we could learn from this is that if we create the right kinds of immunities or safe harbors, then we might get the kind of content that benefits society, in which case maybe we need to deregulate other sectors of our media economy. I'm just throwing out there's a thought experiment. I'm not sure that I can argue fully in favor of this, but I can argue that we don't necessarily have to conclude that the lesson is the internet really is unique, special, or different. The lesson might be that we really want consumer reviews and we want them provided in through multiple channels. Mm. Um, I'm just going to uh, conclude here. Uh, if you want more reading, and you probably don't, but if you do, um, here's a couple of the articles I wrote that lay out some of these thoughts in greater detail. Much of this talk was actually based on uh, this uh, first uh, paper here, if you want to take a look. Um, I've had a chance to lay out my arguments, explain to you why um, uh, internet immunity can be a good and helpful uh, economic policy, and I think I turn it back over to you. Mm -hmm. uh, Thanks. Do you like me to turn off the recorder or um, uh, you... whatever? I think you can. Uh, you can keep it if you want to. Keep, okay, uh, please go ahead. Questions, but uh, thanks very much. Uh, fantastic. <laughs> um, questions? I know I have some. Yeah. A great question. Um, let me let me pose it a little different way. If we had a Section 230 policy for offline media, maybe we've had consumer reviews a long time ago. Mm -hmm. What we learned is that we needed the immunity to create the consumer reviews. Now that we know that the immunity creates consumer reviews, maybe we could go back and fix the the barrier that w to uh, having them in the offline world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you want to continue? please? Wouldn't that then extend the 
liability that um, service providers should have? Uh, right. So uh, let me see if I can restate it. Um, the main justification for uh, uh, creating liability for publishers is because they have the opportunity and usually the expectation that they're reviewing uh, the content and deciding if it's fit for publication. Now remember, Section 230 says you can do all of that exactly like the offline publishers do today, but you get no liability in that circumstance. So even if you choose to build a review website where you read and review every single review that's uh, been submitted before it's posted, and even take efforts to try and verify that, you go back to people and say, prove to me that this claim is true. Prove to me you are who you say you are. Section 230 says no liability. Mm. Now, <clears throat> which one's a better policy? You already know my answer, but you have to decide that one for yourself. Mm. false statements as well as true statements. You mentioned it, but you, you made an efficiency argument, but you, you left that fact out of the equation. Now, the fact that false statements are protected clearly has economic implications, negative implications. Uh, a database that contains false statements, but I don't know how many, has less value to me as a consumer than a database where I know it comes from a jurisdiction where false statements Okay, um, there's a couple of things that are going on there. Let's see if we can pull them apart. First is the, the assertion that you can have more confidence in a database that's in a jurisdiction where there's liability is attached to the publication of content um, because uh, all the false statements are going to be screened out through the editorial and liability um, process. And only false statements. That's the important thing. Oh, well, no. Uh, actually, the whole point is that the editorial process, if you aren't sure what's true or false, you're going to err on the side of screening out more. So you lose a bunch of truthful content as well as the false content. You also, because, or um, that's assuming that anyone can do any verification. I gave the example of um, the you know, neighbor storing through that. Um, that kind of thing could be true or false. We don't know that if we don't know, that content is also not published. If it cannot be verified, it has to be removed. Um, so, uh, so just to be clear, in the other model, we aren't only screening out the false content. We're screening a bunch of uh, uncertain and possibly truthful content in the same process. We're losing a bunch of things, and we don't know what we're losing. Um, but this gets to the argument about the invisible hand of the invisible hand. Are there going to be false consumer reviews? Yes, we have to accept that. Do we care about the fact that there are false reviews? Well, it depends on how good a job the publishers, the review websites do in managing their database. If they do a good enough job that the wisdom of the crowds is still more accurate than not, it doesn't matter if there are false reviews in that uh, pile. If we are, as consumers, relying upon the wisdom of the crowds, any individual review gets filtered out from its importance. Furthermore, because of the fact that reviews websites can do all kinds of experimentation, they're doing all kinds of different things to find a better way of screening out the false content and getting the better truthful information either more highly visible or only keeping that. Are we at the end of that process? No, we are not. We're nowhere close to figuring out the best methodologies for doing that. So will we have review, false reviews at the end of that process? Absolutely. But will we have as many false reviews at the end of the process as we do today? Probably not. We're going to get better. Um, the final thing is, and I don't know what review websites uh, this group uses, um, let's talk about Yelp. How do you feel about Yelp? Uh, how many people use Yelp? Not as many as in the U.S. Yelp is pretty popular. Um, is there a different website that you use frequently for uh, local businesses, restaurants? Um, TripAdvisor is a more popular one here. Mm -hmm. um, TripAdvisor's policies are, are uh, significantly different. But let me just talk about Yelp. Yelp is very similar to TripAdvisor and what it does. TripAdvisor is more appealing to the traveler, whereas Yelp generally is more for the local residents. That's an oversimplification, but that's why I focus on Yelp. The reality is I don't use Yelp that often anymore. 
because as I've tried to look for the guidance to me, I found that I don't view its wisdom of the crowd recommendations all that credible. I find other sites are better. So I am a big fan of vegetarian restaurants. When I go to a new community, I look for the vegetarian restaurants um, that most of you probably have walked right by and never even knew existed, and I'm going to be sitting right there, and I'm going to be having a great meal. Um, and at Yelp, most of the reviews of vegetarian restaurants are written by the meat eaters. And they will write things that will say things like, it wasn't bad for a vegetarian restaurant, or it almost tasted like meat, or I got dragged there and I suffered through it, and then I had a steak afterwards because I was still really hungry. Are those reviews helpful to me? No. Even if they get aggregated into the wisdom of the crowds? No. So because I, I have this perception of Yelp as being a not very credible place for vegetarian reviews, it doesn't matter if the reviews are false or just not tailored to me, I use it less. So the invisible hand of the invisible hand, the review website's reputation as a solution is what actually combats the false reviews. If they do a poor job of false reviews or of even tailoring the reviews to my interest, we're going to use them less. They get drummed out of the marketplace. It doesn't happen instantly, but it will happen. So will we have false reviews over time? Yes, we will. Will we do better dealing with false reviews? Yes, we will. Will review sites compete on the accuracy of their database compared to their peers? Yes, they will, and that's really important. That's what makes the invisible hand work properly. Okay. Uh, let's uh, first, then, then um, Nicole. So, basically, the second factor can also apply to intermediary, uh, intermediary liabilities based in the US that cover other jurisdictions. So, for instance, we have a US based website that does just uh, customer like, responses for UK based restaurants. Does the US sort of have a right then? actually have this sort of law that the US, UK can do nothing about? So the uh, trans-border enforcement problem is really tough. Um, let me explain what we know, and then we'll explain all the things we don't know. What we know is that Congress supplemented Section 230 with a law called the Speech Act. And the Speech Act says that if you obtain a judgment for defamation in a foreign court, and then you try and enforce that judgment in the United States, but the judgment would have violated Section 230, the U.S. courts cannot enforce it, and they have to, the plaintiff has to pay attorney's fees. So what we really didn't want was this kind of libel, li, libel tourism or uh, forum shopping where people would go outside the United States, bring in a judgment to the U.S. that would have been illegal under U.S. law, and then enforce it. So could a uh, U.K. business, unhappy with the reviews about it, bring a lawsuit against a U.S.-based review site? Answer, no. They come in the U.S., Section 230. They come to the U.K., bring it to the U.S., the Speech Act. So either way, they are stuck. However, if the business has, uh, if the review website has a presence in a foreign jurisdiction, any foreign jurisdiction, the Speech Act doesn't help. And so what we've seen, of course, is that many of the Silicon Valley companies have uh, uh, physical presences in other jurisdictions like Europe, and they are having to comply with things like the e-commerce directive, not Section 230. And what we're seeing is globally different databases. The databases start to look different. Mm -hmm. That we have the U.S. business, uh, the U.S. Uh, 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 run businesses um, that are uh, uh, covered by Section 230. And then we've got these transnational businesses where they're trying to figure out how can we keep Section 230 for our U.S. business and not... Uh, uh, violate the law in our local jurisdiction. Now the question becomes, if you are a UK business and you sue a uh, company like TripAdvisor based in the US or Yelp based in the US for, because of the fact they have a UK office, but you're suing based on content that's housed and served in the United States, what happens? Mm. I don't think we have a great answer to that. I think we're still trying to figure that out. Mm. This is where the right to be forgotten comes in. And I have to mention, how do you think I feel about the right to be forgotten? You guys probably can guess where I stand on that. Right to be forgotten, sorry if it's not clear, is a whole hack on the entire system here because it's manufacturing new ways to create a lopsided database. Exactly. What's being forgotten? Not positive truthful information. 
What's being forgotten? Negative truthful information. The most imperiled rhinos of online content is being forgotten. What does that do? It distorts the integrity of databases. This is nothing sophisticated from a U.S. lawyer standpoint. European people, you feel differently. I understand that. To me, this is just bad policy, bad database management. Okay. As you may know, what's going on is that now, because Google has offices in the UK, in Europe, that they are, the European regulators are saying you must go and corrupt your US databases uh, uh, and scratch information that's truthful, uh, negative information has to be scratched for your US audience. What did Google say? We said, we'll create a uh, Hadrian's wall. We'll create a wall that says, we'll only serve certain content in the UK, will serve other content in the U.S., and because they're different, the U.K. people will never see this negative truth of information that's supposed to be forgotten. What have the regulators said? Not good enough. We want global removal of negative truth of information. That is an open frontier. That's a problem, isn't it? That would only compound then what I just asserted over here about uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the divergence of our GDP because now we're going to have really great information in the U.S. We'll have all that negative, truthful information that's helping us um, make sure we don't have lopsided databases. And in the rest of the world, that information will be scrubbed. It won't be available to be seen. What's going to happen? I can't tell you. I will tell you, however, that, um, uh, that uh, this is an open frontier. Did I answer your question? Like a law professor answers it, with no good answer. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Right, and I did mention, um, I think maybe before you got here, that we are seeing a global divergence on that point as well. Section 230 does not require any authentication of users or verification that they are legitimate or that they legitimately uh, bother the goods. If they do that work, they're protected by Section 230. If they do none of that work, they're protected by Section 230. It is, it is their choice to do that. That is not the case. We did talk about the UK Defamation Act, but as this comment points out, there are other places in the world where there's more push towards le legally requiring um, the uh, uh, the verification of the users or of their legitimacy of the status before a review website can avoid liability. You can imagine how I feel about that as well. Um, in terms of your other comment about consumer protection agencies, um, in the U.S., our main consumer protection agency is the Federal Trade Commission. A lot of the work is also done by our state attorneys general. These are usually elected uh, officials who are the chief um, uh, a state enforcer of uh, laws um, in their state. Um, and both the uh, Federal Trade Commission and state <coughs> attorney generals refuse to believe Section 230 exists. 
They just like to live in a fantasy world where it doesn't apply to anything that they would ever argue. So they bring lawsuits against intermediaries all the time that look like Section 230 problems. Now, the FTC usually has won its cases. Um, it has a very good track record in court. Um, and uh, so uh, uh, I think that remains an open field to see how the FTC's enforcement actions will interplay with Section 230. There are definitely limits, and they are aware of it. They just refuse to believe that they'll uh, ever have to encounter them. Um, state attorneys generals haven't been well tested in this, but in 2013, the state attorneys general wrote a letter to Congress saying, we hate Section 230. Get rid of it. It's handcuffing us. But of course they wouldn't like it. What prosecutor likes limits on their authority? They want absolute prosecutorial discretion. And then they decide in their, quote, infinite wisdom, which are the right cases to be brought. So um, of course they wouldn't like Section 230. It's a limit on what they do. Um, but we don't know what the what actual limits are. Now, you did mention one word that I, uh, phrase that I need to, to be clear about. You mentioned the phrase good faith. Now, there is another provision of Section 230 I did not discuss today, Section 230C2. We talked about 230C1. 230C2 basically says you cannot be liable for your good faith filtering decisions. So these might apply to things like Google. If they're sweeping up a bunch of stuff into their review, um, uh, into their search engine uh, database, if they decide to suppress certain things, as long as they do a quote in good faith, they're covered by a separate law, Section 230C2. We see very few cases involving Section 230C2 because of the good faith language, because usually at minimum that requires a trial or a summary judgment as opposed to a motion to dismiss. So procedurally, it makes the case go on longer. Most Section 230C1 cases are granted on a motion to dismiss. What does that mean? Plaintiff files complaint. Defendant says, you have no b viable basis of winning. Court says, defendant wins. Case over. No discovery. No further motions about uh, the legitimacy of the law. Case over. Section 230C2, with its good faith requirement, makes the cases more expensive and makes them more unpredictable. Might make them jury questions. Who is, what does it mean to be in good faith? Um, so when designing a good immunity or safe harbor, don't ever put in the word good faith mm -hmm. because it basically means that you can't rely upon it because what is good faith? We will debate that. That is, it got all kinds of embedded social norms that don't lend themselves to easy, quick dismissals. So Section 230C2, relative failure. Section 230C1 does not have any good faith requirement. You can act in, quote, bad faith about how you manage your, your database of user re content and still get Section 230 protection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just quickly, because I think, I don't know if we're going to be taking, uh, if there's someone waiting for the room outside, does it look like I don't no. see anyone serving okay, the case, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, so we can keep going. <coughs> Right. So the question is, um, there are certain uh, justifications for scrubbing content under the right to be forgotten, such as if the information is excessive, outdated, or irrelevant. Now, this goes back, uh, the gentleman's gone, uh, to the question from the gentleman. Why is that content, if it's truly irrelevant or if it's truly outdated, why is it still in the database? That's a failure of the database. The problem is, how do we know? And this is really the crux of why we're, there's so many people in the United States who think that the right to be forgotten is misguided, because that assumes that there's a single answer to that question. What makes content irrelevant? Or what makes content outdated? And there are multiple users of any item of content with multiple objectives of why they might be using that information. And so unless we knew that every single category of people who might be using that information to make a decision all would equally deem it to be excessive, outdated, irrelevant, it's actually relevant or current or not excessive. And the, the law has no way of balancing those different sub-communities of content users. It treats it as if that's a single question with a single answer. But anyone who knows anything about databases knows that's not the case. There are multiple users of a database with multiple objectives. So if it is truly outdated or irrelevant or excessive, then we would expect the content database managers to be screening that out. Why are they wasting our time? The invisible hand of the invisible hand will push them to eliminate that information anyway. But because we don't know what that is in the abstract, 
The only way we'll know is when people actually try and use that information. But if they cannot find it, they don't we'll know what they don't know, and we'll never know if it was truly relevant or irrelevant to them, or truly current or outdated information to them. We don't know what we don't know. So I don't know if that's a complete answer to your question because I gave you the U.S. view on this topic where we're really in favor of having more information rather than less. Um, but if you can understand that there are different communities of users of content, once you get that point, you realize that those tests are, are defective at their core. Mm -hmm. But wouldn't you argue that RTBF is basically trying to formally do what these companies are doing with this it, this, this, hello, this is it. We have reached the cyber libertarianism moment. <laughs> is it better for the government to require people to do things that they might have already chosen to do? Or is it better for the marketplace to decide which of those things they want to do? Which one gives us greater results over the long run? We don't know the right answers about how to manage databases yet. We're still learning. Once we lock in a single methodology of managing a database, we stop the learning. So is it better to require people things that, to do things that they're already doing, only if you assume that is the right answer for all the rest of time or until the next policy adjustment? The cyber libertarian would say, that's probably not now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm a fan of that content, too. Um, but uh, look, so you're absolutely right. I skewed this talk to focus on one class of a large set of classes of content. And I focused on the economic consequences of that as opposed to the other social implications of that. You're absolutely right. I tried to focus that. I think that that's very helpful to focus it because now we know what we're fighting for. If we lose this value, we're going to be really bummed. There are other things we could do that would cause us to lose other values that would also make us really bummed. But I wanted to make sure we don't lose sight of this one. We talk about free speech and about letting people have their right to express and about um, you know, the, the benefits that we get from being able to express ourselves and the benefits we get from consuming these free expression of others. All that is fantastic. But if we also don't, uh, if we let that mask this particular point, then I think we may make a, a mistake in how we manage the, the information. But I really think that my answer to you will be similar to the answer to the last question, which is simply that um, there are so many different classes of content and different ways in which there's sub-communities that consume that content. It's really hard for us to know the consequences then when we screen out or manage uh, that content from a regulatory standpoint. And so I don't, I, I don't have a single answer about the rest of the content because I can't even contemplate the thousands, millions, possibly infinite number of ways in which people might be extracting, managing, benefiting from that information. It is that unlimited, and that's part of what makes it so interesting. I haven't seen a guy circling out there that yeah. makes us think that maybe there, is, uh, there are some people storming yeah, the gate. I think we booked for, for an hour, but uh, I don't know. Uh, just a quick question, and uh, yeah, if you can ask, thank, thank you. Uh, just, uh, Maria? Yeah, only this slide is uh, staring at me, and in particular the last word, uh, word wealth. Yeah. Uh, from an economic <coughs> perspective, you also talked about social welfare. Do you use the two terms interchange? No, and I, I don't know what I did. This morning I changed that word to social welfare over breakfast, and then I botched the saving of it, and I don't... I, I, and I apologize. I fixed that this morning over breakfast, but I didn't save it properly. So uh, if you will indulge me, let's just call that social welfare. That's what it was supposed to be for exactly the reasons you're thinking of. Uh, okay. uh, just uh, um, uh, so I, uh, I guess uh, I'm going to close with a question. I never thought I would live to, to see uh, the day when an American academic would criticize Section 230. I don't know. If, but uh, I, you ha you have lived to see that day. Yeah, you have lived to see that I, day. I am one of the old diehards uh, yeah. the, who loves such. Remember? Yeah, but but uh, for uh, there is increasingly a, a, a small groundswell 
uh, I think Anbarto has been... Uh, and, has, and has raised reservations. About raised reservations, the... mostly from sort of uh, online abuse and misogynistic mm -hmm. abuse and, and things like uh, uh, th that can get protected. Uh, and I start to feel that there may be, that if there, if there is any chink in the armor of the Section 230, it would be in sort of online abuse, Mm -hmm. uh, particularly a, a, a racist and <coughs> misogynistic abuse and, uh, that goes beyond uh, what would normally be uh, uh, be covered. Is that, uh, do you get the same sense? That uh, so, yeah, I, I mean, so the, the first generation of internet law professors in the United States all came from the same basic traditions, the cyber libertarianism type folks. Um, and then subsequently, as we've added more members to that community, we've seen people come from different places with different experiences. And, and frankly, they're of a, in some cases of a different generation. So they just have a different worldview generally. Um, and so Section 230 has come under substantial pressure <coughs> among the U.S. academic community, um, normally with what I'll call a special interest reservation. There's, they say Section 230 is fine as a general principle, but, and then there's a but, dot, 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 there's one type of content that's a problem and I want to see it fixed. Um, we've seen the same issues with online uh, prostitution advertising. We've seen a lot of work in that area. And there's a whole bunch of advocates who would love to section, fix Section 230 to say, it's fine, but let's take out this one additional category. Now, do you remember what I said up here? Websites, mobile apps aren't liable for third-party content or actions. Remember I did a nice, simple summary, just a few words. Notice what happens as we start adding the buts to that. But IP, but federal criminal prosecutions, but, but, and dot, 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 dot. As we start adding the exceptions to it, this concept gets what I call Swiss cheesed. You can start to see the holes in them, and at some point it loses its integrity. So, um, so there's a, the debate right now in the U.S. among academics is exactly at that point, which is, can we just have our pet exception to Section 230? The diehards say, no exceptions. The uh, the you know the the um, compromise view is yeah just that one exception is fine but then the, that's it and you all know where that ends up the one exception becomes two becomes three becomes infinite and then it fails um, so we're having that battle right now I think okay excellent uh, so I, I think uh, we we should close now in this very high note uh, and thanks again it's it, it has been amazing. Uh, up, Personally, because I find this subject so interesting, I, 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 I've really taken quite a lot. But th thanks again. Thank you. Show, for, for okay. Uh, so thanks. <laughs> we need to stop the recording. Okay. And uh, for people. Uh,